Hi, this is John Blyler, Editorial Director for Extension Media. Today I have the privilege of talking to Gabe Zickerman, who is the CEO of Gamification Inc. So let's let's uh, start. Um, uh, sure. Gabe, good talking with you. Let's start Hi. with just what's gamification and uh, you know what's what's new. When it's so gamification is the process of using game thinking and game mechanics to engage audiences and solve problems. Or put another way, it's taking the best ideas from games and applying them in places where we normally wouldn't expect games to be. Things like healthcare, education. Uh, marketing, advertising, product design, innovation, those are some of the areas where gamification is being used a great deal. As for when it started, you know, the term really went from about zero hits on Google in 2010, at the beginning of 2010, to millions of hits today. So it's as a meme, as a term, gamification is quite new. We think of the modern gamification industry as being 18 months old or so at this point. However, the concepts of gamification have been used for basically millennia. Uh, the military's been using games in one form or another since uh, the beginning of uh, militarism. And then in more uh, kind of contemporary sense, Hollywood has been talking about the intersection of games in real life, at least since the 80s, if you remember movies like War Games or Tron, uh, Tron both right. examples of games in real life kind of coming together. Very prescient, obviously the military stepping up their activities, things like War in the World is Calm in San Diego, other examples of games crossing over with real life, the pace has been kind of increasing, increasing. What's different now is that we have a set of tools and we have a methodology and process-oriented view of gamification as different from just throwing some game ideas at a problem. Now we've got a methodology, now we have a process, we've got a shared set of language that we can use to bring these techniques to life. Yes, I was gonna say, I mean, I, I, would, I would see the intersection of two quite, uh, you know, they come together quite well. So you had mentioned that what's different now, in part, is that there actually is a process and a way to go, go about putting these things together. Uh, and w w can you talk just a briefly about that? Uh, what do you have to do, or where do you see that going, or is that an automated process? Or I well, interestingly, um, you know, actually Gartner Group just released a study earlier this year that talked uh, about gamification's effect on large enterprises. And of course, they were also looking at companies that are very involved in the design of hardware and software. And they said that by 2014, 50% of all innovation in large enterprises will come from gamification. And a great deal of where that innovation is actually being placed today is in hardcore kind of R&D design concepts, product design. And we're starting to see kind of the net result of those things, a couple of things bubbling up at the, at the intersection of hardcore hardware and software concepts. And probably the most interesting is in the automotive industry. So the automotive industry has embraced gamification in a kind of surprising way. They've started to place games into the dashboards of cars with the intent of helping, um, helping drivers learn how to be more eco-friendly drivers when they buy a hybrid or battery electric vehicle. So there's everything from a little, uh, you know, kind of intense data feedback system in the Prius to a little Tamagotchi style virtual pet, which is in the form of a plant in the Ford Focus or Fusion Hybrid that grows lush as you drive more ecologically and starts withering and dying if you don't. And in the Nissan Leaf battery electric car, there's actually a Facebook connected social game that you can play with your friends. Now, that's a great example because there's about $100 million worth of both hardware and software investment being made in gamification by the automotive business and the pace of that seems to be increasing. Where gamification has particular interest for people working on you know, complex hardware issues like chip manufacturers and chip design, for example, is in the solving of really complex problems that require uh, significant parallel human processing resources because nothing is better at getting a large group of people to do some drudgery than a game. I mean, think about Farmville, right? If I describe this experience to you, I say, okay, so here's the concept for this awesome game I have. You're gonna get a little plot of land, plow the field, throw some seeds down, wait for it to, wait for it to rain or water them, wait for them to grow, take them to market. That doesn't really sound like fun at all, right? It sounds like medieval drudgery, to be honest. It's the kind of work that our forefathers gave up so we could be here talking about things like gamification. So what's interesting about the examples from Farmville or Foursquare is how they prove the axiom that if you make something fun enough, people will do it even if it's not, uh, doesn't seem like uh, fun to them intrinsically. And so one of the best examples of that in recent times, uh, coming from more hardcore design issues, uh, was an application called Foldit. 
which was a game that was played online by about 350,000 people. They were looking for, uh, they were looking to crack a major question about proteins in HIV, in the HIV virus, that had been deviled researchers for 20 years. They hadn't been able to solve it. They built all these complex computer models to try to solve it. Nobody could solve it. They couldn't solve it in theory. They couldn't solve it in modeling. So they got 300,000 people to parallel play this game called Folded, looking for this particular protein, folding wow. this protein over and over and over again until they found what they were looking for. And it just uh, happened earlier this year in 2011. So there are these fascinating examples of using, uh, using that. And of course, there's a great deal of overlap with crowdsourcing in that example. Yes, I was going to say, I mean, I, I, would, I would see the intersection of two quite, uh, you know, they come together quite well. So you had mentioned that what's different now, in part, is that there actually is a process and a way to go, go about putting these things together. Uh, and w w can you talk just a briefly about that? Um, what do you have to do, or where do you see that going, or is that an automated process? Or I, I have no idea. Sure. So the process of gamification really begins by understanding that there are three actors in every human design consideration framework. And the three actors are the player, the person who's actually the end consumer, the company organization that's going to uh, sponsor it or is trying to achieve some business objective, and the system itself, which is a surprising, separate, standalone actor that needs its own support and energy. And so we, we follow a kind of stepwise process to understand each of the three's objectives. So we start with the player, and we have all these systems, um, what we call player motivation typologies, where we try to understand what kind of a person is going to be using the system. Are they an achiever? Are they a socializer? Are they explorer? Are they a killer? This is one of our kind of common typologies uh, called Bartle's player types. So we believe that by understanding the core motivation of the player, we can figure out what's fun to them and we can build an experience that talks directly to their motivational state. And then the second piece of it is we try to understand what the uh, business is actually interested in. What's the company interested in? What are the core metrics for success? What are the key uh, determiners of success? And often people go into the gamification equation thinking they're going to double, triple, quadruple, quintuple the behavior of users, engagement of users. But frankly, we don't need to get to quintuple. Some companies do. We don't need quintuple for an amazing results to occur. 15% increase in engagement can be make or break numbers for many businesses. Yeah. So um, gamification has uh, the ability, ha forces us to really think about what it is that businesses want. What do they want? What's a success? And the third piece is the system. And critically, we have to understand that anything we do with gamification is a medium to long-term play. There's no set it and forget it equation. Games like Farmville or World of Warcraft, which are very durable, still have tens of millions of players years later, they're constantly being updated. The developer hasn't thrown World of Warcraft out there and said, oh, it's fine by itself for 10 years or 11 years. It doesn't work like that. That's not how it works. So we have to acknowledge, and this is part of the new discipline of design that gamification is sort of advancing, we have to acknowledge that systems require ongoing maintenance and development tweaking uh, in order to be successful in the long term. Excellent. Thank you. One, one final question. Sure. Are there any are there any intellectual property? Are there any litigation issues attached uh, with this? Well, as it relates to the law and gamification, probably the most interesting kind of angles, and I, I'd point you on my blog, there's some uh, links to some great videos uh, from a guy named Jim Gatto at Pillsbury, who's the expert on kind of uh, gamification law. Uh, great guy, really interesting guy. Okay. Has lots to say about it. But, but what I do know about gamification and the law is that the big areas of interest right now center around a couple of key, uh, key domains. And the first one is generally about virtual currencies. Uh, almost all gamification systems have some kind of virtual currency in them. And as you might expect, the United States Treasury has a vested interest in controlling uh, virtual currency one way or the other. So we have a series of laws that are emerging at state, federal, and then of course uh, national level um, that attempt to rein in or control the way virtual currencies are used. So the bottom line, it's a pretty complex topic, but the bottom line is it's not a free for all where you can just do whatever you want, right? Virtual currency. Um, the second issue is always around user generated content. Anytime you have people in a system generating content, you're going to infringe on somebody's rights. There's no doubt about it. And gamification is no different, especially if we're doing a, let's say, crowdsourced gamification program, which is a pretty common uh, intersection of two ideas. Um, you know, you're always going to have end consumers who are uploading stuff that they shouldn't be uploading, taking content from, you know, big media companies and remixing it and doing something with it that they shouldn't. So we certainly have some issues around that. As for kind of patents and trademarks in the gamification space, I I'm really not super familiar today with any major issues that we've got around that. But of course, uh, knowing the way uh, U.S. businesses are, I'm sure we'll have some big patent wars in, uh, in the offing. 
Excellent. Uh, thank you, Greg. It's, Gabe, it's been great talking to you. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you, sir. I'm going to just do a quick... <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.